Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Arsht, Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council and founder of the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center and the Adrian Arsht Latin American Center. Welcome to all who are joining us from around the globe. Today, we are honored to host this important discussion in recognition of World Refugee Day. You will hear from current and former refugees who will share their personal stories of migration. At a time when it is estimated that over 80 million people have experienced forced displacement, this event is an opportunity to draw attention to the conditions that drive people from their homes, the pull factors that encourage movement, and how host countries and communities can better shape future generations with policies that support social, economic, and political inclusion. A special thank you to the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and the Uzadi Project for partnering with us for this discussion and to all of the speakers for sharing their stories and experiences with us. With that, I will hand it over to Rina Nainan to moderate the conversation. Hi everyone, my name is Rena Nainan and I'm a senior fellow at the Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. I'm also the founder of Good Trouble Productions. Thank you for joining us today for this World Refugee Day. We're really grateful you could be here. Our first speaker today is Susanna Vuk, an account executive at Zoom. Susanna's life and her family's story illustrates something that's been shown over and over throughout the world. The ability of people to flourish and contribute to societies when given the opportunity to do so. Susanna, her parents and her older sister landed in San Francisco in October of 1993 after they escaped the Bosnian War. A year earlier, Susanna's father, a Bosnian, had been working in the Croatian military to help ensure that her family had healthcare services for Susanna's upcoming birth. However, when the Bosnians and Croatians were no longer allies, Susanna's father was loaded into a truck. He was sent to a concentration camp for Muslims. He eventually escaped. He eventually reunited with his family. After then, they left Croatia and they managed to make their way here to the United States. Susanna, we're so pleased to have you join us today. Welcome, Susanna. Thank you, Rena. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Susanna, we're so grateful you could join us. This is a remarkable journey and story that your family has. Tell me, what really stands out to you when you look back at this journey? What, what really resonates with you? Yeah, thanks, Rena. So what resonates with me most was in June of 1992, my dad was captured by the Croatian military as a Bosnian Muslim. And he was working at the borders in Croatia because at this time, the Bosnians and Croatians were allies. That quickly changed. In the war, my parents stayed in Poche because that was neutral grounds. And so that also gave my dad access to go to the Croatian borders, which is 20 minutes outside of Croatia. So my dad had easy access to work in the military so that he could provide health care for my birth. Uh, when he was captured, he was taken to a Muslim concentration camp. My mom at that time was staying at our home in Pachte. It was our vacation home. And the crazy part about the story, and that's always stuck for me, for me throughout the years, was that while my mom, when she found out that my dad got captured, she kept going over to the neighbor's homes to ask how, where does she need to go to save her husband? What does she need to do? Where does she need to go? How does she go get him? And while doing her research, going from neighbors and neighbors, having these conversations, she had realized that our house actually in Pachte is still, we is still one of our vacation homes. It sits on top of a hill in Pachte. And her friend told her that she could actually see the concentration camp from our home. So my mom goes back up to our hill, up to our home, and takes a look down to the right and they point out where this concentration camp is sitting. 
So she could actually see where my dad was being placed on the other side of the river. Um, and so that story has always stood out to me and resonated with me. Now, from there, she decided that it was too dangerous for her to stay and she needed to go save her husband. So she left Pachse and went to Split. And we'll make this a long story short. Um, when she went to Split, she had already given birth to me there with, with my older sister being there, Ina, and six years old. Once that had happened, she had to work her way back, go back to Pachse to get my dad where he was staying and bring him back to Croatia so that they could eventually make it to the United States. It's a remarkable story and to think these details all happened before you were even born. I'm curious though, how did your family make it to the United States? It was August of 1993. My mom, my older sister and I were in a place called Muerte, Croatia. And this is where as a refugee, you, you as a war refugee it's a safe space for you to stay so my mom we had room and boarding there and we were totally safe in this space and in this area and because my mom's name was Liliana throughout the war and definitely when she was on the Croatian side she could get by with saying that she's Croatian because of her name my dad could not get away with that his name is Mustafa it's a Muslim name so she always needed to be by his side and say that she was his Croatian wife. And it's a lot of how they survived and got as far as they did. So during this time, my dad was in at a, hiding out at a friend's house because he was, he had just escaped a Muslim concentration camp. He did look like he had escaped a concentration camp being 110 pounds, looking like he was Muslim. So he was in hiding. My mom found out how to get visas. So she found information, again, by being resourceful, talking to people in the area who are also staying at these refugee camps, what they were doing to escape to Italy. And that's what a lot of people were doing at that time. So she goes over to the dock where the ships, where the ships take people to Italy to leave Croatia from the war. And so she asked one of the guards that was working um, at these docks, hey, what do I need to do? How do I get a visa, right? Just again, having these conversations. They tell her that at that time, she had to reach out to this woman that was responsible for giving out visas. She worked in politics at that time. She was helping refugees in Croatia. She was Croatian. My mom had to, her name was Sylvana. She had to speak to her. And he goes, you're never gonna get her number. You're never gonna be able to reach out to her and get these visas in time. And my mom just goes, watch me. So she runs over to the post office she gets her number she calls the office she so that happens to answer my mom gives her her story my husband was in a concentration camp i just gave birth to my baby girl we need to leave it gives her all these details and so goes okay i'm gonna fax it over to you at the post office my mom grabs it goes over to the guy at the dock she goes look i have the papers i have the visas to go to italy they go that's not good enough it, how do we, need, we don't know how you got this, how you got this, we don't know if it's valid. We need you to send it over to the police station. So my mom runs back to, and calls her again. She picks up again and she goes, how did you know I was gonna call? And she goes, she goes, I had a feeling they were gonna give you a hard time. What do they want? And she goes, my mom goes, they want you to send the paperwork to the police station. My mom runs over to the police station, grabs the paperwork, gives the visas over to um, the guards and they let her through. Now, once they let her through, um, my dad is not very far away. So my mom gives, grabs me and my sister, calls my dad where my dad was staying at a friend's house. He, they bring him over. And then we meet with Mark Bartolini, who was the person that actually helped us come to move over to the United States and stayed with his family. Um, what happened at that time was Mark took our visas and put them in his passport. So now, sorry, let me track back a second. We then waited in, we then waited in line at the docks where the ships were going over from Croatia to Italy. And then Mark, it was a thousand dollars for each person to get on, if, on the ship. My parents didn't have that money at that time and I don't think neither did Mark. So he took our paperwork, all of our visas and put it in his passport and he handed it to the guards to let us in. 
Also, what he did was he knew six other journalists at that time who were Italian. So he made three of them stand in front of us, three of them stand behind us, speak Italian. So it looks like we're all together. We're all doing this together and we're going over together. And so that's how we got to the boat to Italy. And then once we were in Italy, we waited 10 days, 10, day, 10 days there to get our visas to the United States. What I love about this story is the ingenuity and the quick thinking it took from many people, your mom, Mark, your dad, everybody sort of doing a little bit to, to make this journey possible. When you look back at this journey, I'm curious, how do you think it's shaped your life in the United States? Yeah, it's shaped my life here in the United States tremendously. A lot of where my values come from, family, hard work ethic, gratitude, all come from this journey. I definitely have survivor's guilt um, in, in terms of my family and my parents having to leave their family, coming here, um, and then also the amount of opportunity that I've been provided here, an education, a job, my independence, it, it's all shaped me in my life and also my sister's life. So I'm in the middle of three daughters uh, and my older sister as well. She currently works at Facebook. So we're all very involved in the tech space and have built our independence. And what's been the funniest experience to me in the United States as in an immigrant or a refugee or someone who's seeking asylum because you constantly feel a level of not only just, not pressure, you just feel a sense of pressure, but it's not coming necessarily from your parents. You just feel like you're constantly indebted to them. So, you know, a quick story I have for you is, I remember once I started making my own money, I was like, okay, Things have changed now. I provide for my family and my parents. And when we go out to dinner, I pay. And I remember going out to, to dinners with my boyfriend's parents or my friend's parents, and they would pay. And I'd be like, well, why are they paying? Like, you're supposed to pay. You should be so fortunate that you're here and you should pay for your parents. And it's just such an immigrant mentality that now I've learned, right? Um, but it's definitely shaped who we are and the hard work and, you know, constantly giving back through volunteer work. And um, yeah, so it, it's been a big, big part of who we are today. Suzanne, I want to thank you for taking the time to share this remarkable story. And I also want to tell everyone watching that Susanna's story will be part of a new podcast series that we're launching on immigrants who have built incredible things around the world. So you'll hear more about that, which is launching this fall. Suzanne, I want to thank you again for your time. Thank you. And with that, I want to turn it over to our partners at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies to tell us a little bit about the fantastic work they're doing around the world to help support migrants and immigrants. Hola, soy José Félix Rodríguez de la Federación Internacional de Sociedades de la Cruz Roja y la Media Luna Roja en Américas. Y agradecemos poder estar en este espacio convocado por Atlantic Council. Y venimos acá para conversar un poco sobre nuestra iniciativa de puestos de ayuda humanitaria o humanitarian service points. Imaginemos por un momento una persona que ha salido del Caribe y ha ingresado a la zona continental de América e inicia su tránsito migratorio a través del continente cruzando entre cuatro o cinco países. En una zona concreta entre Colombia y Panamá decide tomar el rumbo de el, la selva del Darién. Luego de semanas a través de una selva con miles de riesgos asociados al clima, al terreno y a otros elementos de protección, se encuentra totalmente desprotegida y llega a un punto o una comunidad donde se encuentra un Humanitarian Service Point, donde puede acceder a información, a servicios de salud, a primeros auxilios e inclusive tener acceso a, a información, medicinas o apoyo psicosocial. Esta iniciativa pretende ofrecer servicios humanitarios en espacios neutrales a lo largo de las rutas migratorias y se constituyen como un espacio acogedor para los migrantes y aquellas, situaciones, aquellas personas en situación de movilidad humana que pudieran requerir protección internacional, para que puedan acceder a servicios esenciales. Eh, estas iniciativas de los puntos de ayuda humanitaria pueden ser puestos de ayuda fijos o ayudas móviles, donde las personas migrantes y refugiadas pueden acceder a este tipo de servicios. El objetivo principal 
es contribuir a la seguridad, a la dignidad y a la protección de los migrantes en mayor situación de vulnerabilidad en todas las etapas de su viaje y promover su residencia. En el 2018, cuando los Humanitarian Service Points inician sus actividades en América, inician en la frontera entre Perú y Ecuador con intervenciones que alcanzaban hasta 400 personas diarias, teniendo unos picos de hasta 4.000 personas diarias. En ese momento nos dimos cuenta que el modelo funcionaba y decidimos moverlo hacia otros puntos donde los migrantes estaban enfrentando la, las mayores necesidades. Con eso hemos expandido los Humanitarian Service Points en distintos países, en zonas fronterizas tales como Colombia, Venezuela, Panamá, Colombia, en el Triángulo Norte de Centroamérica, adaptándose a los distintos escenarios a los que se enfrentan los migrantes, que pueden ser caminantes, pueden ser personas en tránsito, en caravanas, o en flujos migratorios más estables a lo largo de la región. Los Humanitarian Service Points se han constituido o están localizados en puntos estratégicos en la ruta migratoria en los países de tránsito de acogida para poder ser de fácil acceso a los migrantes y también poder ofrecer salud y seguridad a lo largo de, del viaje. Lo que se pretende de alguna manera es poder eh, generar un impacto positivo en, en el migrante durante todo este proceso reducir los riesgos, aumentar su capacidad de resiliencia y de alguna manera proteger su vida y su dignidad. El, los Humanitarian Service Point en, en, en América han brindado, por ejemplo, más de 103.000 servicios de, servicios de apoyo eh, psicosocial a migrantes durante el año 2020. Reconocer que el modelo de Humanitarian Service Point funciona no es suficiente. La migración sigue siendo un desafío para la región durante los próximos años. Y esta intervención requiere de mucho más apoyo para poderse adaptar a cada uno de estos escenarios que están por venir. Cada una de estas necesidades implica un mayor esfuerzo. También, el poder sostener el modelo a lo largo del tiempo requiere de mucha inversión, capacitación y capacidades en cada una de las rutas migratorias. El apoyo que hemos recibido nos ha permitido consolidar el modelo de Humanitarian Service Point en América. Confiamos que este tipo de apoyo continuará en el tiempo. Esto nos permitirá alcanzar a mucho más. Yo estoy muy agradecida con esos países porque nos recibieron. Lo que es Ecuador, Perú. Y en Chile también estoy agradecida, a pesar de que pasé por trocha de Perú a Chile. Estoy muy agradecida porque allí trabajé porque allí pude ayudar a mi familia, pude mandarle dinero a ellos, pude ahorrar dinero para poder venirnos para acá. Pasamos por Colombia, y de Colombia, de Medellín, llegamos a Necoclí, y de Necoclí nos metimos hacia la selva. Duramos 12 días en la selva. De broma no me morí. Pero la selva es terrible. La selva es algo que yo no se lo recomiendo a nadie que pase. Yo tengo un trauma horrible. Horrible, tengo un trauma, tengo un miedo dentro de mí. Hay veces que me pongo a pensar y digo que como que hubiese sido preferible quedarme en mi país y no haber salido. Pero ¿y si no salgo? ¿Cómo hago con mi hijo? A nosotros los venezolanos nos ha tocado fuerte. Venezuela, Ecuador, Perú, Chile y ahora para acá. Pero la selva es terrible. La selva es algo que yo no se lo recomiendo a nadie que pase. No es fácil. No nos ha tocado fácil. Es difícil. Es difícil porque uno no sabe si uno se puede enfermar de esa enfermedad. Le puede dar uno algo. Y más yo con mi hijo, que es el peor peligro y el peor miedo que uno tiene cuando uno es madre. Que uno no teme tanto por la seguridad de uno, sino por los hijos. Es bien difícil. Y esta enfermedad, que es una enfermedad que no perdona, porque a cualquier persona le puede dar esa enfermedad, imagínense. Desde que llegamos a la selva, de ahí no, no nos hemos cuidado más. Andamos así. Antes sí nos protegíamos y nos cuidábamos. Nos lavábamos las manos, utilizábamos mascarilla y todo eso. Esto es bastante precario porque uno, por lo menos en la selva, uno sabe que uno va a pasar por algo, pero uno, o sea, ¿cómo le explico? Es como que tú sabes que vas a pasar por algo, ¿verdad? Pero tú no sabes qué 
tan riesgoso es lo que tú vas a pasar. O sea, el peligro que tú te expones. La selva te da dos opciones. Una, o caminas y te salvas. O dos, te quedas en la selva y te mueres en la selva. Esas son las dos opciones que te da la selva. Más ninguna. Primero mi Dios y después mi hijo. Y mi marido, porque yo los veía a ellos desesperados. Que ellos pensaban que me podía pasar algo. Ellos eran mi motor y Dios. Lo único que tengo que desde que entré, que no lo perdí, fueron mis tenis. Esto fue lo único. Ellos me entraron, ellos hicieron que yo entrara y ellos entraron que y hicieron que saliera y se quedaron conmigo. No se me rompieron nada. Este, cuando llegamos allá al otro campamento abajo chiquito, ahí nos atendieron. Eh, yo llegué mal allá. Eh. Nosotros duramos dos noches y un día. Y la, eh, la noche que llegamos yo no fui para la Cruz Roja, sino que fui al otro día. Y allí me atendieron. Me vieron, me revisaron. ¿Qué veo para mi futuro? Ver mi hijo crecer. Ver mi hijo crecer, que sean profesional y que yo pueda seguir ayudándolo hasta que él esté más grande. Eso es lo que más veo en mi futuro. A mi hijo crecer grande, que sea profesional y que podamos regresar a nuestro país y que nuestro país mejore. I want to thank our partners at the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies for that. Next, I want to bring on the founder and managing director of the Yazadi Project, Priyali Sir. Priyali has done incredible work with this project, and I'd love to bring her on to give us a little taste of what she's been up to. Hi, Priyali. Hi, Rina. Thank you for having me here. So tell me a little bit about the Azadi Project and why you focus on women. So the Azadi project uh, was started about three years ago, and our focus has been working with refugee women in camps and shelters, where we provide them a safe space to come together and learn storytelling skills so they can actually talk about their own stories, uh, whether it's about trauma or migration or about how they've overcome all of this in their own voice. It's not journalists, it's not politicians, it's not policymakers who are talking about these stories, but they themselves. And also we give them access to psychosocial support and mental health because most of them have been through very traumatic uh, incidents and continue to go so, uh, to have that. Uh, why we focus on refugee women is because of the intersectional bias, which is extremely high in terms of being a refugee woman. They are facing various layers and various levels of bias, not just as a refugee, as a woman, as somebody who is a woman of color, somebody who comes from a region which is also subject to bias because of their because of its religion, its language. So the amount of bias or the layered levels of bias that refugee women face at camps is uh, is extreme. And I think this makes them one of the most vulnerable populations. And that's why our key focus uh, in the last few years has been to focus on refugee women and girls. Yeah, tell me a little bit about some of the programs that you guys have launched on the ground there. So initially we started, Rina, by only doing workshops which enable them to uh, become digital storytellers. Uh, and the idea was to give them digital storytelling and uh, employable skills so that they could work on, uh, you know, they could become filmmakers they could do online uh, work like, uh, you know, communication materials, build a website, sitting in a refugee camp, sitting in a shelter from anywhere for any other company in the world. The idea was to empower them digitally because these are extremely smart women, uh, talented women and also educated. And they, they can do, uh, you know, they can be working even from a refugee camp. So the idea was to give them uh, these storytelling digital skills. But I think what happened organically was that when you bring women together in a space 
and and you make them feel safe and tell them this is a safe space and nobody is being judged for what they are saying nobody is being judged for the stories they are sharing it organically becomes a very uh, therapeutic process so for us what happened was these digital storytelling workshops organically developed into psychosocial support programs so now the current program that we run in less was in one of the biggest refugee camps in Europe is focusing on storytelling skills along with psychosocial support. Every week women come together in a safe space, they share stories, they feel supported, they dance, they uh, they also share their food and they feel empowered and they talk about how they want to move ahead. In fact, I think at this point I should stop speaking and maybe we should play a recording of two of our women uh, who were and one of them is still part of Azadi uh, and how they have kind of uh, felt while being associated with Azadi. Hi everyone, we are being joined by two very talented and brilliant women. They are refugee women living in Germany and Greece. Nasume and Hamadi is joining us from Germany. And Serge Emadi is joining us from Greece, from the island of Lesbos. Camps in Europe. We will. Nasume, you were. Uh, you were initially in Lesbos. You spent a year or two years in Lesbos before you moved to Germany. Can you tell me a little bit about how life in Germany is and how different it was in Lesbos? Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, we were in um, Greece in uh, Moria camp. We had uh, so many problems. Actors about children. We didn't have any regular school for children. And um, kids, especially um, the, the kids who couldn't uh, walk uh, correctly, they had many problems. They didn't have safe place uh, for uh, playing. They didn't have any playground. And, but uh, here, uh, my son, after uh, one month, he could uh, going to school every day. Uh, the, I had also, I have also teacher here for learning uh, Deutsch. In uh, Greece, we had problem with uh, doctors. We had to waiting uh, many hours in line. Uh, but here, I can go to doctor very easily. Uh, in Greece, I had uh, many problems uh, with the uh, situation. We didn't have electricity. Um, and uh, the foods of camp, it wasn't uh, good. Um, it's a half bake for children. Uh, it was uh, it wasn't eatable. Sometimes we could see uh, we could see um, moldy bread and egg. Also, um, here uh, we have security like in Greece, but uh, in Greece we have to uh, we had to go outside. Uh, we could go outside just once a week, but here. We are free. We don't need to explanation to um, uh, security what we are, uh, what we want to going outside, and um, about uh, uh, what else? Um, can you show us? The can you show us the place where you live now? Here is uh, our yard. Children can play very easily. It's very safe. We have a playground behind the building. And uh, here is our room. Uh, we have uh, everything uh, we need for uh, living, everything we need necessary. And every family is separate living here. Uh, you can see my neighbors all separate. But in sense, we have to live in with uh, other families. Oh, your baby. <laughs> Sorry. Sergey, you are still living in the. Uh, Sergey, tell me a little bit about you about yourself. Wow. Tell me a little bit yes. about your family. How many people live in the tent? What is the situation in the camp? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. I am Sergey from Afghanistan. I have been living on uh, an island in the Lesbos for the one years and uh, nine months and. Uh, 
uh, we, we use it to live in the old Moria, and after the fire, we live in the new camp in the Karasape. The most of the people uh, in here, here is uh, since uh, 2019, and uh, the, the, the lot of the people uh, has rejection, and uh, like uh, me and my family, and uh, the all the all the people that uh, the, they want uh, to go out of this uh, hell uh, because the situation is so bad and uh, in the terms of uh, uh, facilities uh, the, um, the food is uh, not uh, good uh, uh, quality and the electricity uh, is uh, suffered uh, to the uh, generator and uh, we don't have uh, more of a uh, few hours in the day uh, electricity and about the toilet, we use it the uh, plastic toilet and um, uh, don't um, very clean and so dirty. And um, we use it uh, um, the bucket uh, for the showers uh, and uh, uh, use it uh, to the uh, yeah for the out of the camp. Uh, be allowed to the one ounce uh, a week uh, to go out of, out of the camp and uh, if you don't have uh, any appointment from the doctor or the, uh, some things uh, we don't go out uh, and uh, only we have it once on the week uh, go out uh, from the um, how many people live in a tent one tent, yes. Uh, we have we live in the tent, and uh, if you are a six or seven person, you can give the one tent, and if you are a, a three, uh, four person, you uh, uh, you have a half and tent, uh, and it's so problem for the house uh, because we don't we don't have a. Uh, safe uh, for the stick together and uh, we are very close together. So, so this you know, living like this, uh, living unsafe, uh, so can have your mental health, right? You will feel angry, you will feel depressed, you feel sad. Um, yes, yes, yes. when you were living there and you started how did your mental health uh, when I was uh, one of members of Azadi team, it was a great time for me. It was short, but it was effective for me. I could learn uh, how can uh, uh, how uh, we can make uh, happy ourselves in a hard situation. Uh, we need uh, exercise uh, about that, but. Uh, uh, the session and time uh, on Azadi, it wasn't uh, enough. It was very short. I hope you can uh, uh, increase uh, that session and time. And uh, when we leave uh, the camp uh, for a while, uh, it was very effective. We could uh, control uh, ourselves uh, for a while and we could learn uh, how uh, we can uh, make uh, happy others in this situation. Thank you, Masuma. We are trying our best to expand our program and to incorporate more and more women. Thank you. Tadiki, you have attended one session of Azadi. Uh, how was that for you? Uh, did you enjoy that session? What were the other women talking about? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that one session that you attended? Yes, the first um, session with the free uh, project, uh, it's uh, last Saturday, uh, me and uh, some of the women leaving the camp, together we go to the city and we have a meeting about the psychologist and because the woman, a um, lot of uh, upset and uh, the they are so uh, have a stress and um, um, we have a meeting about the psychologists and uh, we speak about the um, good things uh, to less uh, some in the bad uh, situation and upset um, and if, uh, counseling um, counseling and decisions uh, is to be more because the people is. Uh, uh, 
uh, to bad situation and if it is uh, is more uh, it's better for the people in the camp did you enjoy it did you like this yes, yes of course very good you enjoyed and the, the woman uh, very interested to uh, attending uh, to the uh, sessions what did you like about it uh, so good. we have uh, one or uh, two hours uh, we have a uh, speak together and uh, we speak about the good things and uh, we are uh, together laugh and uh, smile and uh, enjoy it. Thank you. Masuma, you have something to yeah. add? Yes, uh, I heard about another uh, program, uh, mental health in uh, camp. But um, I think uh, Azadi was unique. It was a, it has a different way for uh, treat. Thank you, Masuma. What's your baby's name? Uh, Muhammad Matin. Hello, Muhammad. Maybe you can pick him up. Hello, Muhammad. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, <laughs> nice, nice. Thank you, Matsumi. Thank you, Sadiq, for joining us. Welcome. Wish you a very happy World Refugee Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the Azadi Project and Priyali. I want to turn it over now to Rebecca Schur, Director of Humanitarian Initiatives at the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Thank you to the amazing speakers who took part today. We are all awestruck at the stories you shared and by your unwavering determination. I would also like to thank our founder, Adrian Arsht, for her support to our program. And of course, I would like to extend our thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation for their continued support as well. Finally, thank you to all our partners at the International Federation for Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and the Azadi Project for joining this event. We look forward to seeing you again and thank you for joining us today.